Good morning. I'd ask you, do you have a Bible to open it up to the book of Nehemiah? Even if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the rack ahead of you. And Ken has also graciously volunteered to give you his Bible if you do not have one. You will need one this morning because 100% of our passages this morning will come from the book of Nehemiah. We will not be leaving Nehemiah for any reason, no purpose. We may allude out of Nehemiah from time to time, but that's only when we decide to get a little crazy. All of our verses will come from the book of Nehemiah, so I encourage you to open up in your book, or open up in your Bible, and turn to the book of Nehemiah. Tomorrow is the first day of 2018, as I'm sure every single person in this room is aware. And if you're like most people, you've probably sat down with your big chief tablet and your number two pencil, and you have made a list of New Year's resolutions. It's a famous thing to do over this time of year, because the idea of a new year coming is always very exciting. It's filled with possibilities. It's filled with all sorts of aspirations. And so most likely you've sat down today, yesterday, maybe last week, and you're going to do a week from now because you're just that big of a procrastinator like some people, and you're going to make a list of New Year's resolutions. And most likely they'll look something like this, a list that came from 2016. Maybe your list of New Year's resolutions will be, number one, to read more. That's what a lot of people will like to do. A lot of people, a lot of people will say, well, to you, 2018, I always forget what year it is for whatever reason, 2018, this is the year I'm going to read more. I'm going to read two books a week. I'm going to read one book a week. I'm going to read one book a year. Whatever it is, I'm going to read more this year. Some people will say, well, what I want to do this year in 2018 is I want to travel. And what that means, going to Paris, Texas, or Paris, France, that's your own interpretation. But I want to travel. I want to get out. I want to do more. That's what I want to do. Other people would say, I want to spend less and save more. That's always a good habit for anybody to get into. So says Dave Ramsey. Other people will say, what I want to do is I want to learn some kind of hobby. I want to learn woodworking. I want to learn how to work in a car. And so I'll be enlisting traps and stuff for the better part of 2018 to help me with that. I want to learn something new. Other people would say, this one was I thought was interesting. I want to live life to the fullest. Whatever that means to you, go ahead and go after that. Write that down. Live life to the fullest. Get organized is the second most popular news resolution people make every year. You want to take a guess at what number one is? Get healthy. Everybody always wants to be healthier. No matter what your situation in life is, everybody would say, what I want to do in the next year is I want to be fit. I want to be lean. I want to be mean. I want my six-pack abs to show through even a three-piece suit. I want to be lean. I want to be mean. I want to be fit. I want to be athletic. That's what I want to be. And so a lot of people have this idea around the New Year's resolution time that I want to set resolutions and I want to have next year be the best year ever. And there's nothing wrong with that because when you think about resolutions, it's always this idea of looking towards the past in order to shape the future. And in a lot of ways, when you think about New Year's Resolution Eve or New Year's Eve as it was called today, when people think about New Year's Eve, it's a lot like you're standing between two mountains. You have the mountain on one side that is your past, and all the failures, all the successes that went along with the past year. This will be 2017. All the failures that you had in 2017, all the roaring successes that you had in 2017, that's on one mountain. And on the other mountain is your future. It's a completely blank canvas. 2018 can be whatever you want it to be. It can be filled with opportunities. It can be filled with hope. It can be filled with aspirations. Whatever you want it to be, it can be that. I think when we think about New Year's resolutions, in a lot of ways, it sounds a whole lot like what the Israelites did when they came back from exile. That's why we're in the book of Nehemiah this morning. Because when you think about the time period of which the Israelites came back from exile, Babylonian captivity specifically, they are sitting at the precipice between two mountains. They have a long story past filled with tons of failures. You can look at Balaam, you can look at David and Bathsheba, you can look at the whole judges conundrum where time after time after time they fell away from God, God had to constantly bail them out. You can look at the 70, 80 year exile, the 70 year exile that they had in Babylon, you can look at the 100 years that they've since spent in Israel doing absolutely nothing. And on the other half of the mountain, on the other mountain you have this entire future lay out for them. What will the Israelites become? And in a lot of ways, as Nehemiah and Ezra are standing there on the precipice or on the kind of footholds of Zerubbabel who appeared 100 years before them, as they're standing there, they are on the precipice of what I have coined a Nehemiah moment. This is the point in their life where they are going to use the past to gauge where their future is going to become. And in a lot of ways, they need to look towards the past when they survey this. In Nehemiah, the first chapter, starting in verse 4, you can see more or less the situation that's going on in Israel. In Nehemiah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Han and I, one of my brothers, some men from Judah, came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity. I asked them about Jerusalem. So this is Nehemiah inquiring about the situation in his homeland. Verse 3, the report isn't good. 
They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Now listen to Nehemiah's stance here in verse 4. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned four days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. This situation that Nehemiah finds himself in, in Nehemiah chapter 1, is one where he looks towards the past, all of the things that had happened with the people that had failed, the people that had sinned. Israel had committed great transgressions against God and the utter desolation of Israel. And that's his ancestry. Those are who the people that he came from. And as he inquires about the nation that he descended from, they say the walls are torn down, the temples rebuilt, but the city is just basically sitting there smoldering. It's one constant state of disrepair. And that causes Nehemiah so much anguish that when you get to verse 4, it says that he sits down and he weeps for days. That's the situation Nehemiah finds himself in. And Nehemiah finds himself in Nehemiah chapter 1 thinking to himself, I have to absolutely do something at this moment. I have to make a decision. I have to do something about the situation. And so he goes back. That's where the story continues at the end of Nehemiah chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. When you get to Nehemiah chapter 4, or I'm sorry, when you get to Nehemiah chapter 2, this is where he sees the situation as it truly is. Nehemiah chapter 2, in one of, in my opinion, the greatest strokes of leadership, brilliant leadership by Nehemiah. He inspects the city as it is. Oftentimes when this governing king or governing ambassador, whatever the situation is, this foreign ambassador will show up, they roll out the red carpet, they make them see the best parts of it. Nehemiah doesn't want any of that. Nehemiah chapter 2, starting verse 11, wants to see the city for as it truly is. Starting in verse 11, I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. And I rose in the night. I had a few men with me. And I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal in which I was riding. Very humble circumstances. So I went out by night, by the valley gate, in the direction of the dragon's well, and onto the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down its gates, which were consumed by fire. Verse 14, Then I passed on to the fountain gate, onto the king's pool, and there was no place for my mount to pass. Literally, the rubble is so built up that his donkey can't even get through there. Verse 15, So I went up at night by the ravine, inspected the wall, and I entered the valley gate and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had as I yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. What Nehemiah does in this moment is take an honest assessment of his life. And before we go any further, I'm sorry, of the city, before we go any further this morning, that's what I want you to do. You don't necessarily have to do it right now or else you'll check out for the next 20, 30 hours how long we're going to be up here, but I didn't dare any groans, so obviously that's a good thing. I want you at some point, today, this afternoon, when you're watching the Cowboys lose for the 15th time, I want you to sit there and I want you to take an honest assessment of your life. You don't have to tell anybody that you're doing it. You don't have to tell your wife. You don't have to tell your kids. I just want you to sit there and think about the last year, about the last five years, about the last decade, about the last 50 plus years, whatever your situation is, and take an honest assessment of your life. Because when Nehemiah went around the city, and the reason that he points out all these gates is because he goes around the entire city. That's the point of Nehemiah chapter 2, to point this out. Or the fact that he doesn't need to go around the entire city because he's seen enough. He realizes that the city is in complete disrepair. There's some great things happening. The city is in complete disrepair. And I think sometimes in order to move forward with our life, we need to take an honest assessment of our life. See the parts in which we fail miserably. See the parts in which we succeed. Take an honest assessment of your life. Verse 17 in Nehemiah chapter 2, he then says to those nobles, the Jews, the priests, all the officials, he says, you see the bad situation that we're in. That Jerusalem is desolate, its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. That's the motivation there. Verse 18, I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me, and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And then they said, and I like to add in one voice, let us arise and build. And they put their hands to the good work. What a powerful phrase. Because not only are these people saying to themselves, kind of in a few people here and there, you know, it's me, Joe, and it's Paul, it's a couple of the guys, Sammy's included with that. We're going to rebuild the city. The point in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, is this, that this is a communal effort. Let us arise and build. Let us go up with one force and rebuild the city that was destroyed because of our ancestor situations. This Nehemiah moment that they were in, where they looked to the past and they make an honest evaluation, they decided to use to shape the future. The future will be brighter than what we left it at. 
The future will be filled with hope. It will be filled with obeying God's will. It will be filled with restoring the glory of God that had been lost over time based on our actions. And we've become a reproach. His name has become a reproach because of our actions. Can I testify to you and can I argue to you that this is a Nehemiah moment for this church? There's a lot of things that are happening in this church right now that are fantastic. We've had several people, several families move in throughout the last course of the last year. The Fists and the Kinnisons are the two that immediately come to mind. We've had great families move in. We've had baptisms since the beginning of the year, at least on a couple of occasions. And we're also in the middle, as you look out through that long hallway out the back, we're in the middle of a fantastic building expansion where we're going to double the size of our classrooms. We're going to add about 50 or 60 more seats. Those are the pews, not pews, but 50 or 60 more seats for people to sit in. We're going to have a nursery. We're going to have an office. We're going to have a resource room. We think we're going to have all these different things happening. And as we go from 2018 into 2019, Lord willing, the building will look totally different. And Lord willing, we'll be filled with more people. Hopefully, we'll continue this forward progression that we've had. But we'll also have, in the last year, 2017, we've also had our share of misfortunes, our share of unhappy occasions. We've had a disfellowship. To my memory, at least one person, possibly two people, if my memory serving right, I can't remember exactly when that happened. We've also had people that have just, quite frankly, moved away. The Dempseys, unfortunately, have moved to Hawaii, which is great for them. It's bad for us because we miss them. And so there are some negative situations. There are some good things and there are some bad things, but that just kind of comes with every single year. And as we think about the situation as we leave it in 2017 and move into 2018, the question then becomes, as we are at this DMI moment for our congregation, how are we going to move forward? If you've been on Facebook in the last week, which I imagine everybody is, because I think 2 billion people are on it every single day, I put a survey on the Hillside Group on Tuesday afternoon with three questions. The first two questions were for me. That was selfish because I wanted to have not only ideas on how people like the classes that we've had so far, but also ideas for future classes, one of which we're going to be incorporating next quarter, another one we're going to be incorporating the quarter after that. The third question was pointedly for this moment, because I wanted to ask the congregation as a whole, and it was completely anonymous, so I have no idea who wrote what, and I'm not asking you to reveal yourself. I asked the third question of, what can we do as a congregation to improve this church? And I wanted to ask that question, I wanted to keep it honest because I wanted people to actually give their honest evaluation. And I thought the responses were fantastic. A sampling of a few of these. Some of them have, I'm sorry, all of them have been transferred to elders, all of them have been transferred to deacons. But one person wrote, I'd like more opportunities for study and fellowship with one another, such as ladies' Bible study, young adult get-togethers, etc. I think that's a fantastic idea. Because the more we build up, not only spiritually amongst ourselves, but get to know each other outside of these four walls, the more that we can build relationships that will last in the future. Somebody else said, and I think this is an absolutely good point, we need to be more aware, sorry, we need to be more aware of the needs of our older members. Sometimes these people that are older in age oftentimes can't get out, especially when we have a blizzard like we have this morning. The hundreds of an inch, that is more than we've had in years, but it is ice cold outside and those roads are very hazardous. But it's oftentimes hard for people that are older to get out, especially in these types of temperatures, get out at night. And so it's very easy for us sometimes to just forget that they're here. And not in a conscious effort, not to ever say, I don't ever think that they're here, but just because sometimes we don't see them as much, we don't take notice of them. I think it's very important for us as a congregation not to lose anybody in the shuffle, but especially older members who contribute so much to this congregation <coughs> on a number of different levels. Keep those people in mind. And this is one not only for the congregation, also one for me personally. We need to improve on our evangelism. We need to be more outreaching in regards to the world around us. That Greenville needs to be evangelized. Greenville needs to be reached with the gospel, with the pure gospel, despite all the things that are happening not only in this world, but also in this life. When you think about the wall that Nehemiah built in Nehemiah chapter 4, if you would look over there. When you think about the wall, when you think about any building project more or less at all, often sounds the wall is not really the thing that's important. Don't you agree? The wall certainly was important in Nehemiah's time for Jerusalem to have this sense of protection where the outside forces can't get in. And that needs to be built. And for nothing else, as he mentions in chapter 1, because we need to have this reproach removed from us. Sometimes the wall isn't about the wall in the first place. The wall is about uniting people around a common goal and around a common interest to move forward in. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 15, listen to how Nehemiah phrases this. Nehemiah chapter 15, starting in verse... Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 15, sorry. He says, when our enemies heard 
When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his own work. And from that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, the breastplates, and the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. And those who were building the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand, doing the work and the other holding a weapon. And as for the builders, each wore his sword girded at the sides he built, while the trumpeter stood near me. And I said to the nobles, the officials, the rest of the people, the work is great and excessive, and we are separate in the wall from one another. At whatever place, listen to this, verse 20, you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. What a powerful phrase given to the people in Nehemiah's time. That Nehemiah recognizes that the wall needs to be built, that it needs to be restored. And he rallies the people from all different social classes, from all different parts of employment, that everybody is going to be united in rebuilding this effort. Having a common goal and having a common purpose unites people in ways that few things can. And so as we think to move forward as a congregation, as we think about how we're going to move past 2017 as a congregation, rally around some of those suggestions. Find some more. Find people to work with us as we move forward. I would also argue that this is a Nehemiah moment for your family. I can't think of a year. I've been here eight and a half years. I don't know how many letters in the alphabet, but I remember this number. Eight and a half years. And I can't think of one year since I've been here that we have been hit with such a horrid amount of tragedy. And not just tragedy in terms of people passing away, but in terms of just awful things happening in this congregation. I think we've spent more, or had more people in the hospital in this year alone than we've had the other seven and a half years combined. And I don't know what it is about us this year. I pray that it doesn't go into 2018, but it has been a hard year. But I'll tell you this. In the midst of all of these really awful things that has happened, there's been a whole lot of life that has shown for it. As we've watched, for instance, I'm going to name names today because it just happens to be a part of it. But for instance, watching the Hales and the Millers go down every single week so they can sit with Karen during her cancer surgery. You'd have to be a heart of stone to not be touched by that. And as you see the Facebook pictures where Sandra posts every single time she has a chemo treatment, and who do you see in the background, oftentimes reading a historical fiction novel, is Sammy, right behind him. And in one hand he's got a Mountain Dew, and in the other hand he's got Sandra's hand. And that's powerful. And then as we've seen, and I know it's been six or eight months since it's happened, but as we've seen Sherry Curtis visit with us for eight months, she almost had to place membership and have her picture in the directory because she was here that long. But her and James were there every single time Joyce was in the hospital. Always there. Always helping her. And we forget, because now we're six to eight months removed, how horrible a circumstance that was and how much that put everybody to the test. But I'll argue to this, that those situations that have tested this congregation as a whole, and there have been more personal ones that I know of, that you probably know of a lot more, that have tested us individually. But that light that shines for us. And so the question is, as we look towards those things that happened in the past with the cancer diagnosis and the sickness and the illness that so many people have gone through, how are we going to use that to move forward? To those who are past that, how are we going to use those circumstances to help people? To those who are not past it, how are you going to remain faithful and strong in those circumstances that try you? Those are the questions, those are the situations that we find ourselves in as we move forward. I would argue, too, that as you think about the situation that we went through, and as awful as that situation is, that we lose sight of the fact that those things were providing the roots for us in this world. You know, two, 2016, as 2016 closed, moving to 2017, all of us were feeling pretty good about ourselves, at least on some level. We were feeling strong, I'm using that very loose terms. And then 2017 hit. And what reminded us more than anything else is the fact that we need God. And while we know that in very conceptual terms, and although we know that in kind of very broad ideas, 2017 cemented that in our mind. I have never seen a church pray harder. I've never seen a church love more than I've seen this church in 2017. And those roots of love and those roots of faith are deep as a result of what we went through. When you fast forward to Nehemiah chapter 6, right before the wall is finished. Nehemiah chapter 6. It's kind of an understatement to say that the people of Nehemiah's time went through a whole lot of very awful things as they rebuilt the wall. But in Nehemiah chapter 6, starting in verse 10, this is just exhibit number 478 out of all the different persecutions and struggles that Nehemiah's people went through. Nehemiah chapter 6, starting in verse 10, it says, When I entered the house of Shemaiah the son of Deliah, son of Mehitabal, I think it's Mehitabal, 
who was confined at home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you, and they are coming to kill you at night. But I said, verse 11, Should a man like me flee, and could one such as I go in the temple to save his life? I'm going to go in. And then I perceived that surely God had not no, sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambal had hired him. They wanted him at the beginning of that chapter to meet him in the temple to talk about things. And that, Nehemiah saw that for what it was worth. Verse 13, that he was hired for this reason, that I may become frightened and act accordingly in sin, so that may might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. Remember verse 14, oh my God. Tobiah and Sambal, according to these works of theirs, asking God to use his justice. Remember them in that moment of justice. And also, know that I the prophet, the prophetess and all the prophets who were trying to frighten me. When you look at verse 13, you see what Nehemiah has to say. He understands that not only is the point of these people's actions to kill him, but also at the very least to frighten him so that they can cause him to sin. Nehemiah understood that he was not allowed to go into the temple, at least to the part where they wanted him to go into. But what he was hoping, or what they were hoping, was that we could frighten you so that you would run in there and we would have a reason to kill you. And Nehemiah knew that. And so in verse 13, as he's talking about this instance, he says the whole point of this was that I might be confined, act accordingly, and sin, so then the enemy might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. That's exactly what Satan does for us. Satan was trying to use all the different things that happened in your life on a very general scale, but was trying to use all the things that happened to this church in 2017 to frighten us. He wanted us to abandon prayer. He wanted us to abandon our faith. He wanted us to remove ourselves from church because, after all, what's the purpose of worshiping God? Because look what's happening to his people. And the fact that we did it says volumes about the faith of this congregation. Look at this in verse 15. The wall in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15 was completed on the 25th of the month of Lul in 52 days. What an extraordinary circumstance. And when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Let me tell you what other people, if they are familiar with the situation at Hillside, and as they're familiar with all the things we've gone through, let me tell you what they're thinking about this congregation right now. This is a group of people that stands for God. This is a people that does not let the circumstances of this world pull them away from their faith. When you think about the whole situation with Job and Satan, the whole point of Satan's <coughs> grasp at Job was to try to get him to realize or to think for some reason that God didn't have his best interest at heart. That was Satan's whole purpose by introducing physical conflict that would impact them spiritually. And this congregation has gone through a whole lot of physical maladies in the last year. But it doesn't impact us spiritually. Or it should not impact us spiritually. And we stand on the precipice, 2018, stronger than we did at the beginning because of the situations that we went through. The situation has also taught us, in my opinion, to learn to lean on each other. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Fast forward two chapters, Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 1. The wall has since been finished. That happened in Nehemiah chapter 6. But listen how Nehemiah starts in chapter 8. He says, all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. And then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. On the first day of the seventh month, he read it, or read from it, before the square, which is in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, hours, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Nehemiah understood as he came back from captivity, as he comes back from being the cupbearer of the king, that he needs to restore this people physically. And so what he does is he sets himself up as being this person who's going to lead these people back and rebuild the walls. Eventually he would become governor. But what Nehemiah realizes is that the situation in Jerusalem is not just physical, it's spiritual also. And so in order to do that, he enlists or he joins up, not with some random person, but with Ezra the scribe whose sole purpose in Nehemiah chapter 8, pretty much from this chapter forward, is to restore the people spiritually. And when you get to Nehemiah chapter 12, and the wall's finished, and the people have confessed their sins, and there's been a whole bunch of rejuvenation that's happening spiritually, and you see Nehemiah leading one procession around the wall with trumpets, with sounds, with people sh shouting, 
And then you see Ezra on the other half, leading the other procession around the other way, leading them with trumpets, with shouting, with joyful, with praise. And you have these two fantastic parade choruses finally meeting on the other side. And the whole city is filled with glee. People report that they heard it from miles away. But Nehemiah realized, what he understood was that he couldn't do it all by himself, that he needed other people. And I'll, don't get me wrong, I think of the people in this congregation, I think of Joyce, Sandra, and Karen as being some of the strongest, not simply by virtue of what they went through, but by who they were before that moment happened. But I'll tell you this, none of them could do what they did by themselves. None of them could have gone through what they went through by themselves. And anybody else who's gone through a horrible circumstance in this past year could not have done it by yourself either. You need this church. I need this church. We need this church. And within your family, you need each other. The reason that God has created male and female is because he saw that it was good. Because a husband needs a wife. Because a wife needs a husband. And both of these people need to be the spiritual leaders of their household. The husband is absolutely the spiritual leader. But the wife needs to help him do that. The wife needs to be with him through every different single circumstance. Help that family move forward. The husband guiding the family, being the authority figure, being the leader, the wife right there with him, right there next to him providing it. That's what Nehemiah and Ezra had for their life. As you move forward in 2019, or 2018, I'm a little time travel on you, but as you move forward in 2018 as a family, ask yourself, how are we as a family going to move forward? Are you as a family, whether it's three of y'all, four of y'all, two of y'all, one of y'all, whatever the situation is, how are you going to move forward as a family? Will you pray with your family every night? Will you read the Bible together every night? Will you talk about God openly over dinner together? Will you ask your kids about the trials and temptations that go on in their life every single day? Or are we going to spend 2018 the exact same way we spent 2017, 2016, 2015, which is we'll get to God when it's convenient for us. You're in a Nehemiah moment with your family. What are we going to do to make the most of it? You know where the last one's going. You need a Nehemiah moment for yourself. All of us, as we make New Year's resolutions, are standing at a point in our life where the future is not yet laid out, but the past is. And I don't know what your situation is like right now. I've struggled with sin in my life. You've probably struggled with sin in your life, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. But whatever your situation is, you can use the past to move forward into the next world. Move forward into, I'm sorry, to the next year, not the next world. That sounded very spiritual. But you can move the things or use the things in the past to move forward in your life. As you think about the people in Nehemiah, and we tend to think of them as a big blob, as a big group of people, of remnants. But when you think about the people that made up the remnant that returned back from captivity into Israel, they were made up of a whole lot of individuals who wanted nothing more than to serve God. We tend to think as we look at the numbers that this was a gargantuan amount of people, that all of Israel wanted to come back. That when Cyrus issued the decree and Zerubbabel led people back, that he led millions back. And in reality, it was thousands. And then when you see about Ezra and Nehemiah as they're coming back to help, it was even less than that. And what you end up with as you see all the people that could have come back to Israel is you see a very small percentage of the people that went into exile are now returning back from captivity. Two, three, five percent, something along those lines. But every single one of those individuals was somebody who raised their hand and said, I want to be part of the rebuilding effort for God. I'm going to uproot my life. I'm going to get rid of those things. I'm going to move back to Jerusalem to help where I can. And your, your presence here this morning signals the exact same thing. There's a reason that Jesus talks about the broad way and the narrow way, and how there's going to be a whole lot of people that go through the broad way, and a very small, minuscule population that's going to go through the narrow way. Because there is a whole lot of people in this world that don't want anything to do with God. They'll talk about Him. And they'll trumpet Him twice a year. And they'll talk about how great He is. And they worship Him you know, twice a year. They'll talk about how great He is. But there's a very small subset of people who are actually willing to uproot their lives spiritually so that they can raise their hand and say, I want to serve God. Unless you think that this is just something that I'm coming up with off the top of my head. When you look at Nehemiah chapter 4 and you see, or I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 3, and you see the individuals that are involved with rebuilding effort, you can't help but be overpowered by God's notice of the individual. Because the people that came back were not people that were master stonemakers or people that were carpenters that were extraordinary. There are people like goldsmiths, perfumers, merchants. They have a high price thrown in there at various points in time. There are people that did not have the expertise needed to build the wall, and yet they built it in 52 days, not because of their expertise, but because they had a mind to work. 
And as Nehemiah focuses on the individuals, he mentions specifically in chapter 3, verse 20, Beirut, who zealously repaired another section. Seems innocuous, but is very much pertinent to what we're talking about this morning, about the individual. Shalom, in chapter 3, verse 15, who builds the fountain gate, covers it, hangs its doors with its bolts and its bars. The Tekoites, who worked on not just one part of the wall in chapter 3, verse 5, but in chapter 3, verse 27, repaired another wall and did so without the support of their nobles. When you look at Nehemiah chapter 3, it's hard not to be overwhelmed by the sheer amount of gusto that these people have. That they want to build the wall, they want to stand up for God, even though they don't necessarily have the pedigree for it. And as you're sitting here this morning, and you're outlining your past, and whatever that past consists of overwhelming successes, overwhelming failures, whatever that situation is, you may think to yourself, I'm not qualified to do blank. I'm not qualified to evangelize. I don't know how to lead other people in prayer. I've never done an invitation before. I don't know how to do that. I can't lead singing like Brad can. And so because of that, you may think that you're woefully unprepared for 2018. And you think to yourself, well, I'll get around to it when I'm ready. None of the people in Nehemiah chapter 3 were ready for what lay in front of them. None of them, hardly any of them, this was a completely different generation, had been to Israel and never built a wall. And yet look at what they accomplished in 52 days because of that. As you're sitting here this morning and you're taking stock of your life, I want you to think about your past and all the things that you've done, all the roaring successes, all the overwhelming failures, and use that to shape your future. For the people in Nehemiah's time, it wasn't about who they were. It was about who they became. And that's really the magic of a new year, isn't it? The magic of a new year is that it doesn't matter who you were in 2017 necessarily, but it matters who you're going to become in this year. So I ask you, what will you become in 2018? What will define you? And when 2018, Lord willing, rolls in 2019, what are you going to be remembered for? What are you going to be reflecting back on to shape the next year? One of the most important verses of Nehemiah chapter 13 doesn't, or Nehemiah doesn't happen in the meat of the book, if you let me use that term accommodatively. It doesn't come Building of the wall doesn't come with the situation with Ezra. It doesn't come in chapter 1 with the grand prayer. The best verse, at least in my opinion, is the very last one. Because in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23, Nehemiah, after he closes everything up, he simply says, Remember me, O my Lord, for good. And as you reflect back on Nehemiah's life and all the things that he accomplished with these people, you can't look at it as anything but good. The question I ask you, the second question I would give you is, if you were to pray this prayer right now, and you were to pray it again at the end of 2019, what would you pray that God would remember you for? Would it be for good? Would it be for heart? Would it be for work? Would it be for courage? Would it be for faith? Would it be for evangelism? Would it be for your compassion? What would you be remembered for? What would I be remembered for? And begin down that road this morning, or if you really want to, wait till tomorrow morning when 2018 starts. I don't know your path. You don't know your path. And none of us know what, happened, what will happen in 2018. We don't even know if this world will stand till 2018, much less the rest of it. But you have this opportunity right now, this moment, encapsulated in time, to make your life right with God. And that's the very first step to doing anything for it. And if we can help you with that anyway, won't you come? Please stand. Please.